Welcome back to Gamma 20 as we journey through the book of Genesis, which is so important to our spiritual lives. The beginning always matters. Today, we're going to look at study 11, the Abrahamic covenant. We looked at the Noahic covenant last time. Now we're going to look at the Abrahamic covenant when God calls. Uh, Genesis 12 to 13. Let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, we ask that you open up our eyes to this so monumental covenant that affects all our lives. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Right, so we've covered Genesis 1 to 11, and now we're going to look at the part 2 of the book of Genesis, which is 12 to 50. 1 to 11 is when God calls creation into being, and uh, Genesis 12 to 50 is when God calls the new creation into being, right? Um, you've got two things that we see in the book of Genesis. On one side is humanity's failure. On the other side is God's blessing. Humanity's failure fall in Genesis chapter 3. And every time this happens, God then intervenes and provides a promise of a seed that will come one day. The flood happens, Genesis 6 to 8. And then God's promise of him coming and dwelling in the tent of Shem, to be Shem's God. And then we've got Babel and the Tower of Nations. And then despite that, we have a promise of worldwide blessing in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3 today. That's the context. And these are the three sons of Noah, the small, and basically the covenant goes through Noah, one man, and then to Shem, and then right down to Abram. All right, so today we look at the Abrahamic covenant. See, covenants are the way God saves mankind in this new creation through scripture. We've got the creation uh, covenant and the Noahic covenant that God will not destroy the world again through a flood. All right, today it's more specifically down to the Abrahamic covenant. This is the way God keeps creation on track with its original purposes to be like him, combat sin. Right Now, um, if you look at the two men which God has used, Noah, right? And Noah, in Hebrews chapter 11, he condemned the world and became an heir to the righteousness that comes by faith. And, and, and Noah is a typical example of faith, where he believed that God would bring a deluge of water which would destroy the world, and he believed God against all odds, and he built an ark and was saved. And that belief, is translated into right relationship with God. Now, but that, that description is a very small description, a couple of lines on a passage, and we don't really understand much about his faith. Today, we're going to look at Abraham. And in Abraham, that classic verse in Genesis 15, 6 says, and he believed God and God, and he counted it to him as righteousness. How does belief or trust or faith translate into a right relationship with God. We're not going to see just three, four lines as in the life of Noah. We're going to see in the many chapters, if you look in the life of Abraham, Abraham, Abraham is an explanation of what true faith looks like in a human being, right? So here's Abraham and through his life, we're going to have a look into what real faith looks like, and this is the one that's going to encourage us in our own spiritual walk with God. Now, faith begins when God calls. So today, chapter 12 and 13, we're going to talk about God's calling, right? The nature of the call, the promise of the call, and the challenge of the call. So the nature of the call is, and the Lord God said to Abraham, go from your country, your kindred, your father's house, to the land I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in him, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the entire covenant. And the first thing to note is that the covenant, the call, is personal. The Lord said to Abram, didn't say to anybody else, it said to Abram, go from your country, your kindred, your father's house. You would see, if you look back in chapter 11, you would see it is Terah's plan. Terah, his father, took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went forth together to Ur of the Chaldeans to go from earth of uh, Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. It would seem like it's Terah's plan, but 
You will actually look at Stephen when he was persecuted, defending himself in court. He said these words, and Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The Lord of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, Go out from your land, to your, from your kindred, and go to the land I will show you. So here, we know that this call was a personal call, where there's a personal experience where God appeared to Abram. Now, what is calling? We all get confused about what calling is. There are many ideas in the secular world about what calling is. If you look at the Merriam-Webster dictionary on calling, it is a vocation or profession, or career, which one customarily engages in. Another one is a strong inner impulse towards a particular course of action, especially when accompanied by conviction of divine influence. All right. Now, here is Oprah Winfrey. She says calling is very, very important uh, because it defines us. She says if you're here breathing, you have a contribution to make, no matter what background, age or color or creed or gender, we have all been called to earth and at this time for the authentic expression of who we are and the gifts we are here to give. So she brings an important aspect of calling that it, calling is so important it defines us. Okay, um, here's an Olympic skater and she uh, articulates what happens when you're actually in the right calling as it were. She says when she was skating at a very high level it was just one of those programs that clicked I mean, everything went right, everything felt good. It was such a rush, like you feel it could go on and on, like you don't want it to stop because it was going so well. It's almost as though you don't have to think. So when you're actually in the thick of your profession or your, or, 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 or your sport, that, that feeling confirms our calling. In fact, that feeling called flow. And uh, scientists have actually uh, got this graph together and basically decided that if you are in a profession or a job or a sport, the best place to be is right here. When you've got a maximum skill, which is matched to the maximum difficulty, and that's where well, right in the center and you feel that that's your calling. Now, for example, if you've got low skill, right, and a very difficult job, then all you're going to do is get anxiety. If you've got high skill and you've got a job with low difficulty, you're going to get bored, right? And so this is how the secular world defines our calling because it is defined by how you feel and you, how you match up your degree of difficulty of your job together with your skills. Uh, here's Michael Phelps. You cannot argue that he is the most celebrated and successful Olympian in history of the world. And his concept, the problem with this kind of concept is that this is an Olympic champion. And he said these words, really after every Olympics, I think I fell into a major state of depression. I didn't want to be in the sport anymore. I didn't want to be alive anymore. This is after the 2012 Olympics. See, he had flow because he won all these Olympic medals, but that wasn't his calling in the end. Winston Churchill, that great prime minister, called into service during World War II to lead Britain out of a, 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 a dangerous war with Germany writes, I felt as if I was walking with destiny and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour, for this trial. And that was right. He was the right man for the right time for World War II where Britain was on the brink of this defeat. After it all, he says, I'm bored with it all. The journey has been enjoyable, well worth making once. Again, the call, even the fact that he was the prime minister at the moment where his nation needed him, was not all what it was, in, sort of, uh, was supposed to be. He felt disappointed. Uh, here is a uh, top five regrets of dying by Bonnie, Bronnie Ware. And, and this basically describes people when they're going to die and what are their top five regrets. One, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected me to. Right? So here, they may have altered their call according to the expectation of others. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. So the result of this call, at the end of your life, even after all the Olympic medals, something is missing. You know why? Because secular calling is independent of a caller. It is intrinsically selfish. It only focuses on what our idea of the call is. 
our calling makes sense only if there's someone who calls us. And in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it is the Lord who said to Abraham, right? So it's a personal encounter. And it, uh, this personal encounter, right, basically trumps religion. And you can read in Joshua 24, and Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord God of Israel, long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham, and of Nahor, then they serve other gods. So Abraham was a pagan idol worshipper. But when God personally called him, he actually rejected this and moved away. He's been called out. In the New Testament, we've got the church. And the church, the Greek name for the church is called ekklesia. Coming from the word ek is out of and call Kaleo. So the church is a bunch of folk like Abraham, like Terah, who were worshipping idols, who have been called out by a personal call by God to worship Him. Abraham was 99 years old. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am the Lord God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Be blameless because God is blameless. So basically, it is a personal call to a personal walk before God. It is a change of a lifestyle and direction. Os Guinness writes, Our primary call as followers of Christ is by Him, to Him, and for Him. First and foremost, we are called to someone, not to something like motherhood, politics, or teaching, or to somewhere. We are called to Him. If we do not recognize this, then we will never be actually fulfilled in our lives. There's a story told of uh, of one of my friends whose mother recently died of pancreatic cancer. And just before she died, she actually became a Christian after being a pagan for many, many years. People were shared with her in hospital. And what this gentleman decided to do, that he suddenly decided, I want to be a Christian too. And the reason why he wanted to be Christian as well, because he wanted to be in the same place as the mother, because he loved his mother so much. But the issue isn't just changing religion. It is not a religion. It is a personal, he doesn't have a personal walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a personal call by a personal saviour. Calling results in a radical new ambitions. Here's Paul when he's been called by God. He says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Brothers, I don't consider that I've made it my own. But one thing I remember, I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining on to forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So calling will result in a radical new ambition. If you live and wake up every day with no change, then I would really doubt if we actually answered the call. He's already forgotten all his achievements in the past all his worries in the past, and he looks forward in one direction to the direction of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So calling results in a radical new ambition. Right, so that's the nature of the call. The promise of the call is this, and the Lord said to Abraham, now you're supposed to leave your country and go to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. To him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So here is a promise of great land, which is explicated in the later chapters in Genesis. A great nation. He's, here's a man with a barren wife and he's going to get a nation from him. Uh, and a great blessing not only to Abraham, but to all all the nations of the world. This is how God is going to save the new creation, as it were. And, and this process of, uh, uh, of the covenant is worked out through various chapters, not just one chapter. Chapter 12 is the covenant initiation. Chapter 15, there's a ceremony to confirm it. And chapter 17, there's basically a sign, which is a sign of circumcision at that time. And the most important thing to note is the covenant is about the world. It's about worldwide blessing. It is true, Abraham, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And this actually trickles down to us because Paul describes this, this promise is based on faith. Now, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So Abraham gets a whole bunch of promises, but these promises actually come to us. Why? Because we believe. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand 
to Abraham. So Abraham is the gospel. The gospel is by faith. In you shall all the nations be blessed. This is Genesis 12, verse 3. So then, those who are faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So the promise of the covenant comes down to us and we are sons of Abraham simply because we will exposit the kind of faith that Abraham has in his life, similarly in our life. So that is why the study of Abraham is so important. And the promise is not only that, it's by faith, not only that, it, the promise is unconditional. If you look in Genesis chapter 12, or the people in building the Tower of Babel, and they say, come, let us build ourselves a city and tower is top in heaven. Let us make a name for our, ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the earth. It's doing. If it depends on us, it is man-made religion. The promise can only be unconditional if it's responding to what God gives us. I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. I will bless those who bless you. See it here? It doesn't depend on Abraham. If it is a man-made religion, it's me doing, let us build a tower, let us build a church, let us build a name. Here, the promise is unconditional. That's the only way a promise can be eternal. Because if it depends on us, it will always fail. So it's unconditional and we're just responding to what God is doing. So this is depending on self, technological advance, the whole of humanity, the unity expressed in the gifts, or it depends on God. And here you have one man. Here we have a whole bunch of people and it doesn't work out. Here it depends on only one man, Abraham alone, 75 years of age, barren with no hope. So the eternal covenant must be unconditional and it's God's covenant. And then we fast forward to Genesis chapter 22 when the ultimate test of Abraham's faith when he's asked to offer his son Isaac and he actually does that without question. At the height of his faith, God says, and, I, and said, My myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this, and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and multiply your offspring. And basically, he reiterates the covenantal promises which we've looked at in Genesis chapter 12. So if you read here, say, I thought the covenant was unconditional. Now you've got a condition because you have not withheld your son. How can a covenant be both conditional and unconditional? Well, we get an idea of this in Genesis 18, 12, 19. I, God says, For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the ways of the Lord and by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised. So here you can see the interplay between condition and being unconditional. So God commits himself to work so that Abraham fulfills all the conditions of the covenantal promises, right? Um, which is the same promise given to us in Philippians chapter 2, because we are sons of Abraham, Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is worked in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So salvation is worked out in the sense that God is the one working out and producing a lifestyle based on faith. It is God who works in us. So therefore, it's conditional as well as unconditional. All right, if it's unconditional because it's what God is going to give us, but he will move our hearts to, so that we actually are obedient. So, we've covered the nature call, the promise call, now the challenge. Why the call is difficult? The call is difficult because it's a journey. You don't go one shot from one place to another. He says, go from your country, your kindred, your father's house, the land I will show you. Here, it is difficult because he has to leave his family, his culture, his country, everything that he's ever known. And if you live in a Middle Eastern country, country, they're not unlike Chinese, okay? We are embedded in a family, in a culture, in a nation, and you don't leave. These are things you're familiar with. These are things that you live for. And he's asked to leave, and this is not easy. These are the primary forces that shape people, uh, you know, to who they are at that time, and it's the same with us today. We're supposed to leave this and embrace 
a future of children, land, and influence on all humanity. Right? And if you look at his journey, he was at Ur, when he first had a call, go out from your land, and to a land that I will show you. Didn't even tell him where to go. And then verse 4 of chapter 7 in Acts, that he went out from the land of Chaldees and he lived in Haran, stopped here. God hadn't given any uh, other instructions. Then he got a secondary call in Genesis 12. Go from your country, your kindred, your father's house to the land I will show you. Doesn't even tell you where to go. And then finally he arrives in, in Canaan. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. So here we have a journey. It takes time. And, and basically, just like faith, God goes, shows you enough faith, enough light to the next step. And then only after his father died, when he actually leaves everything and goes to the promised land, when he fully embraces the call. Because the call was to leave his father's house. All right? Actually, the father went with him all the way to Haran. And only after Haran, when his father died, then he actually fulfilled the call by going right down to Canaan. And not only that, he actually didn't fulfill it completely. When Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, Lot went with him. Now, the, the, the covenant is that you're supposed to leave your father's house. And who is Lot? Lot is actually his brother Haran's son went with him right right he's supposed to leave all of this behind but he didn't so he he actually went with Lot and took out Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all the possessions they gathered and the people they acquired from Haran and they set down to go to the land of Canaan right now the the challenge is also to follow unconditionally so Wherever God spoke to Abraham, He never told him. And this is the the what? This is the ways coordinates. Uh, this is where you're going to go to USJ five. All right. The, the land was unspecified. The challenge was to follow unconditionally. Because if I tell you exactly where you want to go, you may decide that you don't want to go there. And here you actually have an unconditional challenge to follow God, you know, wherever God leads us. And that is how faith is defined. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance and he went out not knowing where he was going. And that isn't that very much like us. We don't know where faith will lead us even tomorrow. Sometimes God gives us enough light just for the next step and then the rest we go by faith. And if you look, the scientists have actually dug up the remains of his original city called Ur of the Chaldeans. And it was actually a modern, sophisticated city. And this is an animation of what it's supposed to look at based on archaeological data. It was a sophisticated civilization and it's supposed to leave that and live in a tent. Hebrews chapter 9 gives us an explanation. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise. This is the land of promise. This is what he left as a foreign land living in tents with Isaac, Jacob, heirs with him in the same place. So here you're asking Abraham, with all these promises, all he ever got was a tent. And he left all this to go here with all his family. That's the definition of faith. And his wife, the name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. He has to be promised a nation. And his wife is barren. Barren means the womb is dead. There's no chance he can have a child. Against all these odds, he left this and came and sat here. That's the picture of faith. See, when they came to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites, when the land, the Lord appeared to Abraham saying, to their offspring, I will give you this land. So he built there and all to the Lord who had appeared to him. First thing he goes, when he lands, and imagine this is the land I'm going to give you. God shows him. He arrives in the destination. You know who is there? A whole bunch of people called the Canaanites. They are not going to give him the land. Here he's living among all the Canaanites, and God says, this is your land. And he has the faith to believe that one day all this will be mine. And he expresses this faith by altars, building an altar where he worships God. God. Now, the challenge is for Abraham and like for mo most of us is that there's no actual fulfillment. You don't see how this is going to be fulfilled. In Acts chapter 7 verse 5, he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, 
but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. This is the picture of faith. It's like God calling you to Damansara Heights. You see all the bungalows there? You don't even own one post box. And God says, I'm going to give all that to you. You don't even have a child. I'm going to make you a nation as wife is barren. The challenge of the call is to believe the impossible. Now, Hebrews chapter 10, how did he do that? How did he live in a tent and believe that all of God's promises would be fulfilled for him? For he was looking forward to a city that a foundation, a designer and builder. He's got his personal relationship and, and, and experience with this God was so great that he was live, willing to live in a tent because he looked forward to one day in a place where he would be, where it was designed and built by God. The perfect world. Not a world of utopian world which is built by man, but a utopian world built by God. John chapter 8, 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he saw that he would see my day, and he saw it was glad. Which means Abraham had the faith, even though he was living in a dirty old tent, that one day God will bring his son, and that son would save the world. Martin Luther had that kind of vision that is a bit like Abraham living in a world in America where there's racism, and he had a dream that my four children one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. 1963, today is 2022. Uh, it hasn't happened. The only way it's going to happen is you have a dream, and that will be this will happen in the new heavens and new earth. So the challenge for us is to leave, which is basically repentance. Repentance, leaving and embracing. Embracing the norms of the kingdom, the ambitions of the kingdom, the new heavens and new earth, and a blessing to all, humanity, uh, to all humanity. And in fact, the, the transfer of love and ambition is so great when Jesus said, you know, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, and wife, and children, and brothers, and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You don't just change religion on a card. You change your love, your loyalty, and your ambitions to be focused on Christ and Christ alone. That is the kind of Abrahamic faith. Now, the challenge, the final thing is the challenge of the call is trials and temptations, all right? That will deviate us from the trial. There was a great famine in the land, so Abraham, first thing he goes to Canaan, supposed to be a land of you know milk and honey, and in that, it's just basically nothing to eat. So Abraham left the promised land. He went down to Egypt and the for the famine was severe in the land. When he went there, he found that uh, the Pharaoh there loved, you know, liked his wife. And uh, when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, I know you're a woman, beautiful appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you're my sister that it may go well with me because of you, and my life may be spared for your sake. So therefore, he was afraid. He left the promised land, he wasn't faithful. He went down there and he told lies. He told his uh, people there that, uh, oh, this is my sister, so please don't kill me to take her. And in, indeed, Pharaoh took his wife into the harem. All right, so he leaves the promised land, he lies about his wife, endangers her with his cowardice, and endangers his own promise of a nation because you take Sarah away, there is no nation later on. But the Lord intervened. The Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham. So he took Sarah's wife, uh, Abraham's wife, and because he took him, the Lord afflicted him, right? Uh, and, and because of that, he knew, Pharaoh knew that he had done the wrong thing, Right? And he actually released her. Verse 12, uh, verse 16 says, For her sake, Sarai, because he took her, he dealt well with Abram. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. And he actually came back to Egypt after Pharaoh released them because he didn't want the plague on him. So Abram went back, went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into Negev. Now Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Here you've got 
a wrong turn by Abraham. Supposed to stay in the promised land, didn't have the faith, went down to Egypt, lied, and despite all that, God blessed him, came back rich. Uh, when he was in the land of Canaan, they had flocks and sheep. The men who worked for Lot and the men who worked for Abraham got into a fight. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of life, Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. So everybody wanted a piece of the land. And they didn't have enough land, so they were fighting. And what Abraham did to Lot was, look, you know, you look 360 degrees around, you choose whichever land you want, and I will take the rest. And, and this is despite God giving a promise that He will give him all the land. And uh, here you actually have Lot looking down this side, East Jordan River, which is very lush and very fertile. All the way down here, Lot chose this. R wrong choice because there was Sodom and Gomorrah later on, which Lot will actually um, regret. And all the rest, Abraham will actually take. And despite this, verse 14 of chapter 13, and the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, all the land you see I will give to you and your offspring. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth so that no one, that if one counts the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. So no matter what Lot has chosen, God overrules because His promise to Abraham is eternal. And says everything you can look at is actually yours. And the response of Abraham was to build another altar at Hebron. There are three altars that Abraham built in his life. When he first came to the land and God promised him the land at Shechem, then he built the next one at Bethel, spontaneously worshipped God. And when he came back from Egypt, he worshipped at Bethel. And now when he got the promise of the land again, despite giving some of it to Lot and God overruling, he had another altar to at, to God at Hebron. So you can see here is God's, is Abraham's faith, receiving the promise, the challenge promise, overcoming the obstacles, and recognizing God intervening in his life every single time. I will bless you. I'll make your name great. And he did, that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And, and, and who got cursed? Pharaoh, when he took Abraham's wife. So, Trials and temptations come. Abraham was not chosen because he is faithful, because he was an idol worshipper, but he eventually becomes faithful because he is chosen. We're not chosen because we are faithful, but we, are, we, are, we become faithful because we are chosen. There's modern distortions of this covenant that are prevalent. Take, for example, prosperity, gospel, uh, minister together with Joel Austin, Victoria Austin, she writes, I just want to encourage every one of us to realize when we obey God, we're not doing it for God. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. We're doing it for ourselves because God takes pleasure when we're happy. I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. And when you come to church, when you worship, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself because that's what God makes God happy. Amen? So when you come to church, you've got to make sure it makes you happy, good music, comfortable surroundings. You're not doing it for God, you're doing it happy. As long as you're happy, God is happy. Is this the truth? It is a distortion of the covenant. In fact, uh, this is a non-Christian author called Emily Estefani Smith. And she actually writes a book on the power of meaning. And the, and the Wall Street Journal actually commented on this. This is a persuasive attack on the idea that happiness is the goal we should aim for. It's elegant and valuable. And Emily Esafani Smith wrote that the power of meaning basically hangs on four ideas. And the four ideas that we need to belong, we need to have purpose, we need to have a story to tell how we fit into the greater narrative of what the world is doing and our part in it and transcendence. We have got something that goes beyond this life. And if you look here in the life of Abraham, 
Here he's left all this sophisticated Mesopotamian culture and he's sitting in the backside of a desert on a tent. Do you think he was happy? I don't think Abraham was all that happy. But do you think he was fulfilled? Yes. Why? Because he had belonging. He belonged to God. He had purpose. He had to build up a new civilization, a new family, a new nation. He had storytelling. He would be part of the way God is going to restore the world to himself. He had transcendence that he would go beyond of Israel. He would be with God in the end for all eternity. Here is Michael Phelps, the greatest Olympian who ever lived. Here is he today. When do you think he was most happy? Michael Phelps now goes around sharing about his experience talking about suicide and depression. You know what he says? That's more, way more powerful than winning all those Olympic gold medals. Those moments and those feelings and those emotions for me are light years better than winning the Olympic gold medal. That is what we should be called to. So 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 gives us all the four factors with, which uh, Emily Stephanie, uh, uh, as for Honey Smith says, belonging, we are our chosen race, a holy nation, people for his own possession. We have a purpose that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we have a storytelling because once you were once you were not a people, now you are a people of God. And we have transcendence because once we belong to God, that will extend beyond this world. We will be with him forever. So for each of us, let me challenge you. The most important thing in our lives is the call. May we be faithful to the caller. And that is where we find meaning in our lives. Let it transform us as it has transformed the life of Abraham. May God add a blessing to his word.